Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing endometriosis. So endometriosis is a pathological process whereby you end up with uh, endometrial tissue in locations where it should not be. So remember the endometrium is this inner lining of the uterus. It lines the uh, the um, um, cavity of the uterus. Okay, uh, so if it's present somewhere that it shouldn't be, basically, that's what's called uh, endometriosis. And we've discussed two of the most common places where this endometrial tissue ends up, which are the ovaries and also the uterine ligament. We're now going to move on to discuss uh, the recto-uterine pouch. Now, for this, we're going to draw uh, another picture, um, and this time we'll be looking at, again, a different angle, basically. So we're going to go back to this picture, and we're going to basically draw it again a little bit more accurately. Okay, so we're going to look from a side view, basically, and see what uh, we see, basically, from that angle. So we're going to take a uh, sagittal section through uh, the um, woman, and we're going to see um, the uterus, uh, the rectum, and uh, the bladder all in um, uh, sequence. Okay, so basically, to put, uh, you put, make the perspective very, very clear, here's the tummy, uh, then uh, here is the thigh beginning here, okay, and then you'll have the gluteal region here, okay, and then it will go up like so. Right, okay, so we'll now put on this picture where uh, the pubic synthesis is, and it's a little thin, but never mind. Um, we'll put where the bladder is, we'll put where the vagina is, and then we'll show where the rectum is, and then we can uh, say um, where the um, rectovaginal septum is. Okay, so let's start with the rectum. So the rectum basically is this sort of a shape here, and then it will end with the anus here. Okay, like so. Right, um, now we're going to have to squash in the vagina here, so actually I'll put the pubic synthesis first to orient us, so here this can represent the pubic synthesis, so I'll just label things up. So this is going to represent the rectum, okay, and uh, this here is the pubic synthesis. Right. Okay, uh, so that's where uh, the two halves of the pelvic bone have joined together at the pubic region of that pelvic bone. Okay, so this is the pubic synthesis. Okay, uh, then in front of this you have, well behind this rather, uh, you have the um, bladder, so we'll put the bladder here. Okay, so that's that can be the bladder. And then we'll stick in the vagina in the middle here, so here's the vagina and then it will have the uterus which will come out above here like so. Okay, like that. Right, so let's label things up. So this is the vagina here, and uh, obviously it continues on to the uterus up here. Then we also have the bladder. That's the final thing we need to label on here. So this is the bladder. Okay, right. Uh, so, basically, from this angle, we can understand where uh, the recto-vaginal septum is going to be. It's going to be in between the vagina and the rectum here. So, basically, you have a thick septum of connective tissue that sits in between the rectum and the vagina. Now, the equivalent in males sits between the rectum and the prostate gland. Okay, and this piece of connective tissue is known as the recto-vaginal fissure, uh, not recto-vaginal fissure, the recto-vaginal septum. Septum. Okay, so the recto-vaginal septum. And basically, you can end up with endometrial tissue, so tissue that should be lining the uterus up here. It can exist within the recto-vaginal septum, and that's the third most common place for endometriosis to occur. Now we're going to discuss another thing that we can understand from this picture here. Uh, so the fourth most common place for um, endometriosis to occur is what's known as the recto-uterine pouch, which is also called the pouch of Douglas. Okay, so the recto-uterine pouch. Now, uh, to explain the recto-uterine pouch, and I'll just put that it's also called the pouch of Douglas, I need to explain to you, well, make sure that you're familiar with the concept of the peritoneal cavity. Okay, so basically, uh, the peritoneal cavity 
it's the simplest way to understand it is imagine it as this sort of balloon, basically, which is very, very flexible. So imagine we've got this sort of rectangular balloon, basically. Okay, so we've got this three-dimensional uh, structure that then has a two-dimensional surface. Okay, so the, the main portion of the balloon is actually the two-dimensional surface. Yes, there is air contained within the balloon. That is the way that I would encourage you to think of the peritoneal cavity. Basically, you've got this layer, this surface of connective tissue that makes a closed surface, basically. So uh, you can't ever get to an end. If you've got a little man walking on this two-dimensional surface, or an ant, if you like, walking on this two-dimensional surface, he can never find an edge. It's like the surface of the Earth. There's no end to the Earth. You just go round and round. You can't find an edge to the surface of the Earth. Okay? So, it's a, that's what's the fancy mathematical term for that is it's called a closed two-dimensional surface. Okay? And it's full of, like, a fluid. Okay, so the cavity within there, which is full of fluid, is then called the peritoneal cavity. Okay, now, basically, this structure is within your abdomen. You have one of these within your abdomen. Uh, a sac, a two-dimensional surface of connective tissue which contains peritoneal fluid, basically. And what happens is you basically have your, um, your um, intestine and many of your other abdominal organs uh, inside this peritoneal cavity, but they're not actually inside it. What's, it's very, very clever, basically. So basically, if you imagine taking your intestine, let's say, let's just draw a little piece of tubing here, okay, like so, uh, then it, it's actually not inside the peritoneal cavity. Instead, it's actually external to the peritoneal cavity. But what you do is you basically Imagine taking your balloon and now having your little piece of intestine outside of the balloon. So it's not inside the balloon, but what you're going to do is you're going to push it against the surface of the balloon. So I'm going to take this piece of intestine, I'm going to push it in, 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 in. Now, at no point am I ever going to rupture the surface of the peritoneal uh, cavity. The surface will remain intact, but I'm just going to push the balloon and I will invaginate the surface, basically. So what I'm going to do is effectively this. I'm pushing it in, creating this little invagination like here. So here's my finger coming in here, and then I've got my intestine, which I'm pushing in inside. And that's what happens, basically, to the intestine. It is sort of, well, when you look at it, it looks as though it's inside the peritoneal cavity, but it's actually not inside the peritoneal cavity. It's just been pushed into it, and basically it's dangling within the peritoneal cavity now, but it's actually external of the peritoneal cavity. It never broke this membrane and actually went inside. It's not in contact with the peritoneal fluid. And this is the origin of the mesentery, basically, because if you imagine closing off this gap where my finger was now. If I pull my finger out, leave the piece of intestine there, and oppose this piece of the uh, two-dimensional surface of the peritoneal cavity with this piece here, and sort of close off the gap, then I've got um, the intestine sort of suspended within uh, the peritoneal cavity um, by this sort of portion of the two-dimensional surface that is a double portion, basically, and this is what's known as the mesentery, basically. You find uh, intestine dangling in the peritoneal cavity by these connections, and this is the mesentery, basically. Okay, so that's just a quick introduction to the peritoneal cavity. Basically, what you have is a little portion of this peritoneal cavity dangling behind uh, the um, uterus and the rectum, okay, so I'll highlight it in because it doesn't look particularly distinctive at the moment. So you've got a portion of this dangling behind like that, and that's known as the recto-uterine pouch, or the pouch of Douglas. So you can get uh, endometrial tissue uh, forming within that uh, en recto uterine pouch, basically, and that's the fourth most common place uh, for endometriosis to occur. In addition, let's now talk about the fifth most uh, common place for the uh, endometriosis to occur. It can also occur in the pelvic peritoneum, so the peritoneal cavity in the pelvis, basically. So not specifically now the recto-uterine pouch, but just generally the pelvic peritoneum. Okay.
And now the sixth most common place for it to occur is actually it can end up inside the large and small intestine, basically. So, if you imagine it's now within the peritoneal cavity, so if we've got endometrial tissue growing within the peritoneal cavity, then you can imagine that it's in contact with the large and the small bowel, which are, um, well, they're held in the peritoneal cavity by their mesentery, basically. They're dangling in the peritoneal cavity. And you can imagine that uh, this endometrial tissue could potentially invade through uh, the two-dimensional surface of the peritoneal cavity through the wall of the intestine and end up in the intestine basically or in the wall of the intestine. So often the sixth most common place uh, is for it to be occurring in the small and large bowel. Okay, and this might um, actually strike you as though this is very similar to cancer, basically, and that's quite what's quite scary about this disease, that it is actually, these end, this endometrial tissue shows a lot of the properties of cancer. It's very, it can be very invasive and metastatic, basically, similar to cancer, but it isn't cancer. Okay, so small and large intestine. Okay, and then finally, the seventh most common place for endometriosis to occur is that it can occur in the mucosa of the cervix. So let me now just draw you another picture of the cervix, okay? So mucosa of the cervix. So the cervix has a different structure to um, the endometrium, basically. So if you've got endometrial tissue growing uh, at the cervix, then that's also a form of endometriosis. Now, clearly it hasn't um, gone as far as it could go in some of these other examples, uh, but it is still not supposed to be there, and it's therefore ectopically placed at endometrial tissue, and therefore is classified as endometriosis. So, let me just draw you a little picture of the cervix. So we'll do a more in detail picture than before. So here is uh, the vagina, ending with the cervix here, okay? Like so, and let me see if I can get it a little bit more symmetrical this time. There we go, that's okay. Right, so I'll bring this down a bit. And basically, the um, I'll just draw the epithelium of the vagina and then the epithelium of the cervix because there basically is a transition between the epithelium of the vagina, which is squamous epithelium, and then the epithelium of the cervix, which is then um, columnar epithelium. Okay, so here's the columnar epithelium of the cervix, and then here is the squamous epithelium of the vagina here. Okay, so let me split these up. So these are squamous epithelial cells. They're very flat uh, and they don't have a huge amount of cytoplasm, like so. Okay, and then uh, when you transition from the vagina up to the cervix, uh, you get uh, the transition from this squamous epithelium, which I'll draw in green. I'll colour this in in green here. So here in green, this is the squamous epithelium of the vagina and it transitions from this squamous epithelium to a columnar epithelium. Okay, so I'll now show the columnar epithelium in blue. Okay, like so. So here are the columnar cells of the cervix, here. And basically the cervix is secreting a lot of mucus, okay? So it will also have uh, glands which are underneath the actual epithelium, so it will also have uh, little tubes, basically, which are invaginations of the epithelium of the cervix, which will be secreting mucus, which will go into the lumen and then propagate through the lumen towards uh, the surface. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion of the cervix in the next video.